بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا تبعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وبعد Respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته I would like to discuss a very important and pertinent and relevant issue with you today insha'Allah ta'ala in light of the current situation and the pandemic that we are facing the coronavirus may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and our loved ones and our family and insha'Allah Allah remove this disease from us as, as quick as possible insha'Allah ta'ala ameen this uh, current situation the pandemic throughout the world has raised a lot of questions and I see a lot of people are discussing a lot of different different issues relating to Islam um, like for example people are asking a lot of people are asking and also answering you will see a lot of online fatawa and articles and uh, video uh, lectures of various scholars and experts and many others as well about various issues such as for example <clears throat> because Ramadan is within two three days inshallah we have Ramadan and Mubarak so during Ramadan is it permissible for us to recite from a copy of the Quran which is called the Mus'haf you see the Quran is the book of Allah and then the copy of the Quran uh, is technically termed as Mus'haf Mus'haf means the copy of the Quran and what's written inside that copy that's called Quran amongst many names the Quran has many names so a lot of people ask that in Taraweeh Salah uh, because throughout uh, our life every year we are able to recite or listen to the Quran completely in Taraweeh but this year due, due to the lockdown situation we will be at home we, we can't recite we can't offer Taraweeh behind a person who has memorized the Quran the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Hafiz as we like to call him um, so can we ourselves pick up the Quran in our hands or just like open the app and recite from the Quran with maybe Allahu Akbar with one hand uh, or maybe holding with your friend put your left hand here or here whatever and looking through the app and, and reciting from the app the Quran app or actually physically uh, lifting a Quran and turning the pages a lot of people are asking this there are issues such as people who are asking that is an online prayer valid because we can't offer Jumu'ah Salah so can we do an online virtual Salah uh, so like for example some Imam in his house is giving the khutbah uh, and then after that he's leading the Salah and 20,000 people one in Australia one in Japan one in Botswana one in South Africa one in the UK the Imams in in, in you know Qatar for example and everybody's joining you know just watching the screen you know the, the laptop and Allahu Akbar Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Rahman Rahim and halfway what's happened your Wi-Fi is gone and suddenly like what's happening to your salah like the Imam's gone in Ruku and Sujood and then he's come back in the second rakah and your 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 Wi-Fi is gone or the laptop you know has shut off or whatever so people are asking can we offer Taraweeh Salah virtually or Jumu'ah prayer virtually and also things like uh, online nikah there's people somebody asked me as well about uh, nikah that can we do an online nikah so for example the brother is in America the sisters in the UK one witness is in North Pole and the other witness is in the South Pole and uh, all four like do a conference call and make a nikah so, so many of these type of questions because the world is turning I mean it was virtual anyway to an extent but now this virus has made a lot of things more virtual and I think that as we go ahead and even when we emerge out of this crisis uh, the world will look quite different and a lot of things will be more virtually um, it seems so so a lot of these type of questions to the point that as an anecdote somebody actually really asked me this or suggested this that uh, could I I can't go to perform Umrah uh, in Ramadan because there's lockdown and no one's allowed to go to perform Umrah 
can I just put the Saudi or the Mecca channel on and put the Kaaba there and then just go in my house, go round and round. And I think maybe he said that, can I just go around the TV? So like the Kaaba, the, the screen's on and I can go around the Kaaba, run around the TV seven times, you know, and make tawaf. Could, could I do that? And would my tawaf be done? I mean, to, to that extent, people are asking. Now, there's lots of these issues. What I want to just discuss in this uh, video is not to go into details of these individual issues. I will mention just briefly, but I really want to explain a concept of deen, a concept of sharia, which I think sometimes we forget, neglect, overlook, or we have not been explained that concept. And because of that, all these questions arise. Once we understand the concept, the that concept, understanding the concept will inshallah automatically answer all our questions. So like these issues individually, just briefly about individually, these issues, and I don't want to go into the details of the and the fiqh of all these individual issues, but if I if I take it from the last one, the example I gave, that going around the TV for Kaaba, I don't think anybody would say that's valid or allowed, it's haram. I mean, it's probably, I don't know if it's haram, or maybe it could be haram, but it's definitely not tawaf. Uh, also, the online nikah, according to the vast majority of the scholars, say an online nikah is not valid. Uh, in there, there is a bit of slight difference. Some scholars, you know, looked at it uh, that it may be permissible, but because the issue is that, is it necessary for people to be physically in a place, or virg is virtually allowed? So physically, like for example, you see, you don't need the bride and the groom physically. That's agreed upon. You can have uh, the the bride, for example, make the groom himself an agent. Say the girl is in the UK, and the guy, the boy, he's in America. And she can just email him or tell him over the phone or tell his father or anyone she can appoint as an agent over the phone. Uh, and then that person physically in one gathering brings two witnesses. So he has two witnesses and he just, there's only three of them are needed. And first he will say the ijab, he will utter and pronounce the ijab that this is the, the offer, offer the ijab on behalf of the sister. She's made me an agent, she's given me permission. Or if she gave someone else permission, then that person comes in the gathering uh, and the two witnesses are there physically. This is allowed according to everybody. So that's fine. But now people are asking that no one's together anywhere. So even the witnesses, ones in like America and ones in Japan and the brides in Canada and, and the groom is in UK, for example, or four of them. This, according to the vast majority, is not permissible and precaution dictates that a nikah should not be valid like that but there is some fiqh debate and some scholars have allowed it so if people follow certain scholars and they feel confident and they trust them then maybe they could follow that opinion so that's another issue above that the other issue i mentioned about online prayer whether it's jumu'ah salah or taraweeh prayer this is not permissible um 99% of the scholars of the Ummah will not allow this. Uh, it's not permissible. Um, salah will not be valid. The reason is because it, it, one of the conditions for prayer is that the Imam and the Muqtadi, the follower, they both have to be physically in one area. They need, they need to be physically in one area. What we call in the books of fiqh, they say, Ittihadul Makan. The Makan has to be, the lo locality has to be one. It doesn't mean you have to stick to the Imam. You could be in the second self or the third self. And then there's a bit of details in the various madhahib. Like if you're a bit far away, then is it valid or not? How far away? But what we call one place, one locality. Physically, you need to be together. So a virtual type of prayer that you are in America, in your house, and the Imam is in Japan, in his house, and you're following that Imam's prayer, that's not permissible. Uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّمَا جُعِلَ الْإِمَامُ لِيُؤْتَمَّ بِهِ The reason why an Imam has been uh, made an Imam is so that you properly follow him and the word لِيُؤْتَمَّ بِهِ indicates that there's اِتِّحَادُ makan, like you're both there physically. So that's a very, very important condition. So that's not valid. Uh, and lastly, uh, reciting from a copy of the Qur'an in prayer, uh, again, here there's a difference of opinion, according to the other madhabs like the Shafi'i madhab, the Hanbali madhab, uh, they do permit it that a person who is reciting from a copy of the Qur'an, it is permissible for them to recite. And then there's a lot of detail, some just allow it in 
tarawih or tahajjud or qiyamul layl or nafil prayers and not in fard, others allow it in both. Uh, according to the Hanafi school, and the mainstream opinion in the Hanafi school is that it is not allowed and not just that it's not allowed, it invalidates the prayer. Whether it's fard prayer or tarawih prayer or qiyamul layl or tahajjud or nafil or whatever prayer, reciting and looking into the copy of the Quran whilst praying is impermissible and invalidates the prayer because there's an external inspiration you are taking you're not reciting from your memory you are taking from an external source so like for example if someone sits there and you just say Allahu Akbar and someone who's sitting there eating a burger says to you Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen and you say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar Rahman Ar Rahim and you say Ar Rahman Ar Rahim you're not praying out of your memory like any part of the Quran they sit next to you and they recite it and you follow them that invalidates the prayer because you are taking an inspiration from an, someone who's external outside of your prayer. Uh, it's likewise a copy of the Quran, it's external, even if it's written on a wall or in a mihrab and you recite from there, invalidates the prayer. There is another opinion in the Hanafi school, which is of the Imam Abu Yusuf and Imam Muhammad, the two students of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala. They don't say the salah is invalid, but they still consider it to be impermissible or makru tahrim, prohibitively disliked. So not allowed. Why would you want to do that? I mean, uh, if something's makru or prohibitively disliked when you follow uh, the Hanafi school. So that should be avoided as well. Now, the issue here is that I want to discuss is the concept. Like a lot of people, I actually have a very detailed article on this about uh, reciting from a Quran copy from a Mus'haf uh, during Tarawih Salah or during, during prayer. I have a very very detailed article uh, and uh, I remember that when I wrote this article uh, it's it's on my website daralifta.com but when I posted it a lot of people have these question these this question or many various types of questions that come into mind I remember somebody when I posted it on, on my Facebook page uh, somebody asked what would be the ruling if a woman is performing taraweeh alone and wants to pray looking inside the Mus'haf so she can complete a whole Qur'an in Taraweeh. Like she wants to complete the Qur'an. So wh why can't she? Uh, or someone, you know, you see that the quest, these type of questions, this is the concept, this is the important part of this video that I really want to explain, inshallah, which will answer all these questions. Someone might think that, look, I follow the Hanafi school, but... Uh, Okay, Imam Abu Hanifa is saying that it invalidates the prayer and his two students are saying that it's makru tahrim. But okay, the Shafi'i allow it, the, the Hanbali allow it, maybe the Malikis allow it. I'm not going to kill someone, I'm not going to go murder someone, I'm not going to do zina in someone's house. What am I doing? I'm just completing the Quran. I'm actually doing something uh, rather than me offer taraweeh by myself and just recite wa duha and alam tara and surat qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq through every rak'ah. Why can't I do something good? I will every year I've been privileged and honored to be able to hear and listen to the whole Quran in Taraweeh. And this year, because of lockdown, I'm not privileged enough. You know, it's so sad. I feel so sad about it. Why can't I? I'm going to miss out of a completion of the Quran in Taraweeh. So if the Shafi'is allow it, like, what's the problem? Like, I'm not going to do zina. I'm not going to kill someone. That question. The person who's, who wants to do, do tawaf around his TV, he's thinking every year in Ramadan, I am blessed to go to the house of Allah. But I'm so crying that I can't go for tawaf this year because there's lockdown and, and there's no flights and I'm not allowed. The Saudi authorities are not allowing me. I'm, miss, I'm missing, I'm missing. Why should I not just do this? I'm not going to punch someone. I'm just going around the, around the TV. Um, the one online as well, um, uh, I perform Jumu'ah every... It's been... 30 years in my life that I've never missed a Jumu'ah prayer and now the coronavirus has taken away my Jumu'ah from me and I am so sad that why am I not able to offer Jumu'ah I don't have people around me at home that I can offer Jumu'ah I don't want to pray Dhuhr I've never missed Jumu'ah let me just do online and just pray I'm not doing anything bad I'm not doing anything sinful I'm not eating pork I'm offering Jumu'ah I'm not doing anything bad so this thought comes to people's mind and it's actually because of a good reason it's because of a good intention it's like people feel sad that they can't do certain things that they wanted to do 
So this thinking that, uh, can I just do it in a different way? Maybe it's a lot of coin to somebody, but like, I want to do this. The point here, brothers and sisters, is that, you know, when someone asked me this about looking into a Quran app during Salah Taraweeh, because I, I want to complete the Quran. I asked that person the question, when they asked me this, I said, why do you want to do it? What's your reason? I said, because I want to complete the Quran, like every year I've completed it. But like, why do you want to do it? Why? What makes you not want to just read in your salah from the last few surahs of the Quran and want to complete the Quran? What's your main objective? So the person thinking said, mm, because I want to complete the Quran. I said, yeah, I know you want to complete the Quran. Why do you want to complete the Quran? Because um, they're thinking. Now, two types of answers people give. One is that uh, because... I want to get more reward from Allah. Now the problem here is that we are deciding what Allah is going to give more reward to us on. What guarantee is there that Allah is giving us more reward on completing the Quran than just reciting, looking inside a copy of the Quran and completing it, but less reward in not looking in the Quran and reciting just certain surahs of the Quran? Like what? How have we decided that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give us more reward? So if it's more reward, the person can say, well, it seems more reward because here I'm completing the whole Quran and in the other situation, I'm just reciting certain surahs. But again, there's no principle in Sharia that doing more always gives you more reward. Imagine someone's offering Maghrib Salah, three rak'ah, they really enjoying and say to Allah, Allah, today for you, Maghrib, I feel so spiritual. One more rakah extra, four rakah Maghrib. What did they do? They actually invalidate the whole Maghrib. It's actually sinful if they think Maghrib is four rakah. They might say, well, what did I do? I didn't do zina. I didn't go and beat someone up. I didn't swear. I didn't slander. I didn't have a pork hamburger. I didn't go and steal. I offered one more rakah. One more Surah Fatiha, one more Surah, one more Rukur, one more, two more uh, Sujood. I've done good things. But the point is that even if they are good things in themselves, it's not what Allah asked you. You see, the issue is, is not that the issue is bad. It's not the issue is, is that the thing that you're doing is not bad in itself. It's what Allah wants from you. This is the point. So some people say that because I want more reward. I normally say that, how do you know Allah is going to give you more reward? Some people say, but the other issue that some people answer, the other answer people give, is that I feel more spiritual. Like I feel, you know, I feel better if I offer Jumu'ah online. Or I feel better if I complete the Quran. The answer to that is that Deen and Islam is not about what feels better. It's not about what you think and we think is spiritual. It's not about a feeling. Somebody might get a feeling buzz doing some like crazy dancing and, you know, like thinking like doing, hitting the head and doing something and, you know, shaking the, the rear, you know, air, you know, the rear part of the body uh, and thinking that that's dhikr and they feel buzz. You see, the basis of all the innovations is this. When people talk about innovations and bid'ah, with all the details and the different types of bid'ah, but when something is agreed upon as a bid'ah, why is it a bid'ah? It's not because the thing in itself is bad. None of these innovations in themselves, you're not eating pork, you're not doing zina, you're not stealing, you're not murdering, you're not killing. You're actually doing something good in itself. But the point is that you're doing something which Allah and His Messenger وسلم, did not ask you to do. And you're thinking that this is part of the deen or part of that particular issue that you're doing, part of the, you know, the situation. So therefore, when people want to do these things, they think of two things. Number one, they think they will get more reward. Answer is that, who said Allah is going to give us more reward? And number two, they think they feel more spiritual. Deen, so the, the point here, the, the concept I want us to understand here today is that our deen, our religion, our Islam is not about two things. It's about the third thing. It's not about 
It's not about what we think is going to give us more reward. It's not, it's not about what we determine it will give us more reward. And number two, it's not about feeling. It's not about feeling spiritual. Deen is not about fulfilling our desires, like what we feel like doing. We enjoy a particular type of ibadah, but that's not what Allah has asked us. Somebody might enjoy four raka'a maghrib, but Allah has not asked anyone to offer four raka'a maghrib. So it's sinful. It's not about what we think Allah will give us more reward on, and neither is it about a feeling of spirituality. What it is about, Deen and Islam, is about submission. It's about submission. Submitting to what Allah wants us. Whether we like it, don't like it, whether we feel it's easy, whether we feel it's difficult, whether we enjoy it or we don't enjoy it. This also answers the other question. You see, look, before I, the other question, and I'm, I will end with that. I gave the example of Furaka Maghrib. Fasting in Ramadan is fard. We are approaching Ramadan. Yes, we all have to fast 29, 30 days. Fasting in Ramadan is fard. If we don't fast in Ramadan, then what happens? We are sinful, but if there's no excuse, not, not fasting is sinful. Imagine somebody really enjoys like 30 days of fasting and really felt amazing and very spiritual. Eid day arrived and they said to Allah, Oh Allah, like I love fasting for you. Even my Eid day is sacrificed for you. Today on Eid day I want to fast. What will happen? That person will receive a sin. Sin for fasting. Because the point here is fasting in itself is not the objective. None of these forms of ibadah are objectives. Even salah itself, Allah doesn't want us to go four times. Like, that's not the objective. Neither salah is objective, neither the fasting is objective, neither hajj, neither zakat, none of these rules. These are just rules Allah made to see whether we submit or not. Islam means submission. Allah could have said every five times a day instead of salah, Allah could have said five times a day, just touch your head like this. Just do like this. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, five times. Fajr time, here, here. Dhuhr time, here. Asr time, here. Maghrib time, here. And Isha time, here. Then that would have been an ibadah. For Allah, whether doing this or doing this, doesn't make a difference. Allah doesn't need any of the ibadah. Ibadah in itself is not the objective. This is the reason that the same salah, if we do not offer it Fajr time, Dhuhr time, Asr time, Maghrib time, Isha time, we are committing a sin. And the same Salah we offer at sunrise or sunset or when the sun is tiwa, when the sun is in, at zenith, it is haram to offer Salah. Salah. If Salah was good in itself totally, then there would be no occasion when Salah would be haram. But Salah is not the objective. Allah wants us to pray when He says pray. When he says don't pray, then praying is sinful. Allah says fast in Ramadan, then fasting is fard. When Allah says don't fast, then fasting becomes haram. Eat day we can't fast. Another example that comes to mind, you know, in Ramadan, suhoor and iftar. Suhoor, it's recommended that we eat suhoor. We can eat at night. We'll inshallah get the reward. But the later we eat the suhoor meal, the greater the reward. So eating till the last few minutes, like five minutes before, three minutes before, like we, ta'akhir fi suhoor is recommended. And with iftar, there's a hadith, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, ma yazalu nas bi khair, ma ajalu al-fitr. That people will be in good as long as they haste with the iftar. So as soon as the sun sets, we are supposed to take our iftar meal and open up our fast. To delay it unnecessarily is makruh, and the more you delay it, the more wrong it is. What's the reason? The reason is this point, submission. Because it's like Allah is saying to us, eat when I tell you to eat. And don't eat when I tell you don't eat. So suhoor, Allah says eat. So eating, 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 eating. Allah says, stop, okay, stop, because time of dawn has arrived, starting my fast. 
Then Allah says, don't eat, don't eat, don't eat. When Maghrib time arrives, then Allah says, eat. So as soon as Allah says, eat, we eat. If someone says, Allah, I've been hungry for you for 19 hours anyway in the summer. Can I not just give you one more hour? Allah says, I don't, I didn't never wanted your 19 hours anyway. I only wanted you your submission. So if I said to you four hours, then four hours would have been your submission. If I said 19 hours, then exactly 19 hours. One hour extra, I don't want that because I don't need the fast from you. I need submission from you. So the whole deen is about submission. This is the point. The whole deen is about submission. So all these issues that come to people's mind. I will mention this last point. Well, before the last point, to finish off this point, that look, uh, all these issues, the, the examples I gave you are all agreed upon. So everyone knows that you can't offer four a Maghrib prayer. Okay? Everyone knows you can't, it's agreed upon, you can't fast on eight day. You can't pray sunrise, sunset, agreed upon. So some, someone might say, but these are all agreed upon issues. The examples that I've given are all agreed upon issues. Whereas some of the examples that we are discussing today, like reading from a copy of the Quran, allowed according to some madhab, and one madhab allowed, one madhab not allowed. Some people might allow online Jumu'ah and Taraweeh. So that's not like, you know, fasting on a day, because that's like agreed upon. Yes, agreed. The examples I gave you were examples of clear agreed upon. But the concept is the same. That Islam is all about submission. It's all about whether we feel spiritual, whether we feel like doing it or we don't feel like doing it. Whether we enjoy doing it or we don't enjoy doing it. Deen is not to fulfill our you know, wants and our feelings. It's not about enjoyment. Rather, we receive more re reward if we don't enjoy it. You know the hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about the Qur'an that uh, whoever recites Qur'an and is stuck like, is, uh, finds it difficult to recite the Qur'an will receive double reward. So, you know there's a hadith as well in Sahih al-Bukhari the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said إِذَا مَرِضَ الْعَبْدُ أَوْ سَافَرْ كُتِبَ لَهُ مِثْلْ مَا كَانَ يَعْمَلُ مُقِيمًا صَحِيحًا When a person is sick or is traveling, he or she shall receive the same reward for when they were not traveling and when they were healthy. So if someone's healthy, they can fast. But if they're not healthy, then they can't fast. Allah will give the same reward. So if someone can complete the Quran in Taraweeh, non-lockdown situation, Alhamdulillah, but if there's another excuse and you can't, Allah will give the same reward. And who knows, Allah might give more reward. According to Allah, it's about the sincerity. If you're really sincere in reciting just Surah Al-Ikhlas, every rak'ah of Taraweeh, Surah Al-Ikhlas, but your um, Ikhlas was so amazing that it might give you more reward than the past 30 years because you're crying and you're so sad that you couldn't complete the Quran and you're at home and you've recited Surah Al-Ikhlas 20 times and 20 rak'ah of Taraweeh with so much devotion. On Yawm Al-Qiyamah, that particular year, 20 rak'ah Taraweeh or more rak'ah Taraweeh, might be more weighty in the scale of deeds. Who knows? So this is why um, recit recitation of the Quran and also recitation of the Quran is not restricted to Taraweeh. So outside Taraweeh, we can recite the Book of Allah. During the day, complete the Quran. Over Ramadan, complete the Quran. Maybe also try to memorize it. Take inspiration. Some of the early scholars, uh, some scholars that, that when they had to go to in a situation where they were they were not able to because uh, it's reported from some scholars from the subcontinent Sheikh Al Hind Maulana Mahmoud Al Hassan and his student Sheikh Al Islam Maulana Hussein Ahmed Madani Rahimahumallahu Taala they were actually imprisoned in Malta which we visited last year in the company of my teacher Sheikh Sheikh Al Islam Mufti Taqi Uthmani Hafizahullah uh, so when they were in Ramadan actually during the day the student Sheikh Al Islam used to memorize one juz of the Quran and then at night they would perform taraweeh because both of them had not memorized the Quran. So the teacher was sad a bit. And being sad is normal. That look, you know, every year we are privileged to rec to recite or we are privileged to listen to a complete Quran during taraweeh. But this is the first time because we are in a prison, we will not be able to hear the Quran. So the student, Sheikh Hussain Ahmed Mani, he said, you know what, during the day, I'm just going to memorize one juz. 
If some of you can do that, alhamdulillah, but not everyone can do that, of course. Um, so the point is Islam is all about submission. So the concept is that just like someone might feel that they want to fast on Eid day, someone might feel that they want to fast one extra hour after Maghrib, just like someone might feel that they want to offer one more rak'ah of Maghrib, just like somebody may feel that they want to offer salah at sunrise. These things are haram because Allah has not told us to do that. Likewise, somebody might feel they want to complete the Qur'an, but in their madhab, what they are following, and this is my last point, that yes, here the madhab, some other madhabs allow it. Why can't we just follow another madhab? The issue is that, this is another topic, but just a summary of it, it's not about madhabs and it's not about which view or which imam has said what. That's not the issue. You know, when we follow these Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, Hanbali madhabs, following these madhabs is not because, especially for the followers, it's not because one madhab is completely like more correct over all the madhabs. That's not, that's not what we're saying. If I follow a Hanafi school, for example, of course, I'm not saying every single ruling in the Hanafi Madhab is more correct according to Allah than every single ruling of the Shafi'i Madhab. No, that's not the point. The point is that I am following a systematic way, structure, a formulated system of rules. Some of It's a package of rules. I am submitting to Allah, to a package of rules which the great mujtahids have decided. Now, in that package that I receive, there may be some things that will be easy, there may be some things that may be difficult, there may be some things that I enjoy doing, there will be some things I don't enjoy doing, some things I feel spiritual about, some things I feel less spirituality regarding, but regardless, I am just doing all of them as a form of submitting to Allah. Not because they're all more correct, yeah, the mujtahids themselves, they give that opinion that which is more correct. You see, I'll, give you, I'll finish off with this example. Somebody asked me that, look, according to the Hanafi school, combining prayers whilst traveling is not allowed. Okay, that's an issue. There could be other issues. So somebody who follows the Hanafi school, they said, look, um, can, when I'm traveling, can I not just take the rukhsa from the Shafi'i madhab or any issue, can I not just take the easy opinion from different madhabs? Now that's a very de detailed issue that requires a lot of discussion. But what I explained was that, well I asked, then why do you want to do it? Because it's a bit easy, sometimes a bit difficult. Now this is difficult, it's a discussion. But what that person said to me in their question was that, according to the Shafi'i madhab or the Maliki and Hanbali, Combining prayers, as an example, is permissible. So if anyone follows the Shafi'i Madhab, if they combine prayer, is Allah going to punish them? No. Is Allah going to punish Imam Shafi'i? A'udhu Billah not. Are they going to hellfire for combining prayers? Of course not. She asked me, this sister, it was a course, and this question came that, if Allah is not going to punish and put into hellfire Imam Shafi'i, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed and all their followers for combining prayers in traveling. So if I combine prayer, why is Allah going to punish me? Valid question. See, if you do something in your madhab, and we don't know if Allah is going to punish anyway, but it's not permissible in your madhab. So something's permissible in another madhab. So why are they allowed to do it? And why am I not allowed to do it? A valid question. So the answer I gave was exactly the same. It's not about the issue itself, whether combining or no combining. Allah's, these matters don't matter. These issues don't matter to Allah. Like what's combining or not combining? Blood coming out, wudu is invalidate or not invalid. If, if the salah itself is not the objective for Allah, these rules are not the objective. The objective for Allah from us is submission. So what I said to her was that Yes, if someone follows a madhab in which combining prayers is valid and allowed, then they will enter Jannah for doing that. Sorry. They will enter Jannah for doing that. If someone, this is what I said to her, that if someone combines 
prayers following a madhab because it's allowed, they will. But if someone follows a madhab in which it's not allowed, then it's sinful for doing that. Reason being is that the issue of combining is not the issue. The issue is that why you're doing it. Not what you're doing, but why you're doing it. If you're doing it because it's come to you as a package of rules and you take the yusr and usr, the difficult and the easy and the good feeling and the not good feeling and the one you feel spiritual about and the one you don't feel spiritual about. However, you just take a whole package and you follow it because you think, I'll submit to Allah. I don't want to follow my desires. I don't want to follow and do what I enjoy doing. So as part of that package, there was a ruling that you can combine prayer. Alhamdulillah. So the, the issue is not the issue of combining prayer, rather why you're doing it. If you're doing it because it's come to you as a package, then fine. But if you're doing it because it's not come to you as a package, but because you're finding it difficult, you don't want to submit to that rule. You don't like you're finding it difficult. You feel you're finding it a bit lazy. Or for example, you you follow the Shafi'i school and your blood comes out from your body. Wudu is not invalidated according to the Hanafi school. If blood comes out from your body, wudu is invalidated. Now one day blood comes out, you feel lazy. Oh, but is Allah going to throw all the people in the fire of hell who follow the Shafi'i school and pray salah and they have blood coming out and they can pray salah? Their salah is valid. Why is my salah not valid? So I should do that as well. But the point is not that. The point is that why they are not doing wudu and why you're not doing wudu. Allah made blood. Blood is not impure to Allah. Like, what's so, why does Allah hate blood coming out and think, okay, perform wudu? That's not the issue for Allah. The issue is that if you're following a system, a system of laws in which you've got yusr and usr, easy and difficult, the whole package, in there there's one rule that if blood comes out, of your body and it spreads your wudu is broken but you're feeling lazy now you're not submitting so it's not because you're not doing wudu is because you're not submitting to the command of Allah you you are feeling lazy you're not submitting to what Allah wants from you so anyway I just thought I'll explain this to you the summary of all of this is that uh, all these rules are not in themselves the maqasid, the objectives of sharia. Ah. The objective of sharia, ah, the main objective is what we call ourselves. Muslim. Islam means submission. We call ourselves Muslim, Muslima. Muslim means the one who submits himself to Allah. Muslima means the one who submits herself to Allah. So we submit to Allah and we take all the rules that Allah gives us, the agreed upon ones, and if they are disagreed upon ones, then we follow one system, whether you follow this system or this system or this system. But once we take that system, then all the rules in there, we take them on, whether there are some that are difficult, some that are easy, some you feel enjoy uh, enjoyment doing, some you don't feel that enjoyment, some you feel spiritual doing, some you don't, you feel less spirituality. Regardless, the objective is I just want to submit to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I want to... Uh, in front of Allah, I want to show that, oh Allah, there are so many things in here that are difficult. There are some things I don't actually enjoy doing, but this is what's given to me as a package of rules. So I will do them regardless and Allah will consider you to be a submissive. And this submission takes us to Jannah and Paradise, inshaAllah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to understand Deen and Sharia and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all and give us all afiyah. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.